Amen, and good morning. Good morning, everyone. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. I hope that you know uh, your value and your influence uh, and that you never underestimate that. And so we want to bless you today. Hope you have a great day uh, this morning. I also want to say congratulations to graduates, uh, university, college, high school, preschool, I don't know. It seems like it's graduate season, and so... um, Yeah, blessings to you, and congratulations on your milestone as well. My name is Brian, and it's just good to be with you. And uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about good news. Now, in the church world, we kind of use this funky word called gospel, which means really just good news, good news about Jesus, right? And uh, that's what we want to talk about. What is the good news about Jesus, and how do we share that good news? So as we begin this morning, I want to give you a little bit of a challenge. So if someone were to come up to you and ask you, what is the good news about Jesus, what would you say or what scripture might you point them to, to read? Anybody? John 14, 6. All right, we got one. I was thinking one of the most popular verses in the, in the whole of the Bible is John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. It's a great summary of the good news. And it's a great reminder, isn't it? So I want to point you to another verse that I like. It's also in the book of John. It's from John chapter 10. John chapter 10, starting at verse 9, and it says here, this is, this is a passage of Scripture where Jesus is talking about being the good shepherd and his followers the sheep, and, and this is what he says in John chapter 10. He says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now, here's what I love about this passage. It talks about how Jesus, really, the good news is that Jesus made life with God possible. He opened up a door or a gate that was closed to us. It was simply the separation from God because of our sin. Jesus opened up this door so we could have life with God. But even more than that, he wants us to have a meaningful life, a purposeful life, an abundant life, even now. And that is good news. That is good news. Now, I don't know if you know my, my spiritual journey. I think I've shared this uh, before, but I grew up in a church, a, a church really all my life. My, my family, they're Christians, and uh, we would go every Sunday, sometimes twice a Sunday. And uh, I remember very much knowing and understanding this basic concept that God loved me. I even believed that Jesus, and and really kind of knew that from a very young age, that Jesus died for me. Now, did I fully understand the depths of what he did on the cross or all of the implications? No, not even in in the least. But I remember very vividly as a senior in high school, when I first really feel like I encountered Jesus and chose, say, I'm, I'm in, I'm in on this, I remember I was watching a video series of Tony Campolo. Anybody know that name at all? It probably dates me, right? Um, but, it, you know, it was a video series, so it was on VHS, okay? So that, that gives you a little clue, right? And I remember watching this, this video series, and, and Tony was telling all these great stories, and he was talking about people who had you know, left their jobs, they'd moved into the inner city, they'd done all these things, great things for God, and I was like, and it was all about how you can make a difference, and I don't know what it was about that series, uh, about whatever it was, it, maybe it was my personality or this idea that, hey, let's go charge the hill, I'm, I'm, I'm in. I wanted to live a purposeful, meaningful life, right? I wanted to, to find that abundant life that Jesus was talking about. In fact, we do that here this morning, this part of God's purpose. We're we're fulfilling that here this morning as we worship God, right? That's his purpose for you. He would desire that. We're all made to worship. In fact, we kind of get at this idea of abundant living 
through our four strategies. We talk about worshiping God. We talk about engaging the Bible. Why? Because God has revealed himself, and he wants us to know him. The way we know him is by engaging the Bible. Or we talk about belonging in community, that we were made for relationship, right? We were made to learn from each other and grow together. We're also made to invest in others. So in a simple way, we, we communicate this idea of abundant life. We get outside of ourselves. We serve. Now, I was all in, right? I was all in. I was ready to go. I was excited. I was like, yes, I want to make a difference with my life. I want to experience this abundant life that Jesus has for me. Here's, here's what I did, though. I got it very wrong. I got it completely wrong, really. (laughs) See, I understood in the heart of it that, you know, Jesus died for me, and it was by His grace, by His grace, and through this sort of funnel of faith, the way that we receive His grace, I was saved. I got that. But what I didn't get is that everything else was on me. It was about me pursuing this life, this abundant life, this purposeful, meaningful life. It was on me to live that out. But here, guess what? This is the good news, friends. It's not. As we are saved by grace, I want to show you, so we live by grace and we serve by grace. We lead by grace. Jesus wants us to know his grace and that it is simply the pressure's off. All we have to do is follow him. He wants to show us a pattern for living that is based on his his grace. That's good news. In fact, I want to turn to a passage of scripture in, in Matthew 11. I want to read this morning. Matthew 11, starting at verse 25. And it's a simple framework I think Jesus calls us to. It's based on three imperatives. It's come, come to me, take up, and, and learn. Okay? So we're going we're gonna to look at that in just a minute. But let me read, starting at Matthew 11, verse 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you are pleased to do. All things have come, been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me. All who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, powerful scripture. The context for which I just want to share with you kind of the context Jesus is doing all the Jesus things, okay? And all the verses and chapters kind of leading up, all the way from Matthew 5, all the way to chapter 11. Jesus is doing all the Jesus things. He's proclaiming, he's teaching, he's casting out demons, he's doing all these miraculous works. It's amazing. And here's what I love about Jesus. He identifies with me. He's in his hometown, it's like, He's the favorite son, came back to Cedar Falls, and he's doing all these incredible things. And guess what? He's frustrated because no one's responding. In fact, it says, you know, Matthew's little comment in verse 20 says, then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. They did not change their ways. (laughs) And then he says, woe to you. He, he gives all these warnings. But then in verse 25, it's like we're, we're kind of lifted back. The veil is lifted back. And we see Jesus having this conversation with his Father in heaven. 
And we're seeing the intimacy that the Father and the Son had with each other. And we're given a glimpse, we're given a glimpse into this, this relationship that Jesus had with his Father in heaven. And what does he say? He says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. In other words, what is he saying? He's saying this. This is not for the know-it-alls or the proud or the people who think they have it all together. It's simply for those who have a, a childlike faith and a willingness to trust. That's who this message is for. It's not for all those people who perform well, who do all the right things. It's for people that are simply open-handed. And then he says this, all things have been committed. In other words, all things about the kingdom of God have been committed from the Father to the Son. And then he says, if you want to know the Father, guess what? You need to know me, the Son. And then he says this, it's an incredible invitation. Invitation number one, he says, come to me. Come to me. Come to me. He doesn't invite us to go to a place, embrace a vision, do a job, or even fulfill a mission. But enter into a personal relationship with him. Come to me. Rest in me. He wants us to enjoy his friendship. He wants us to go to him for insight and direction. He wants us to experience what his rest. Come to me, all who are weary, all who are burdened. I mean, isn't that good news? You know what? I'm married to a teacher. You know who knows how many days left of school are more than the students? It's the teachers. They're tired. They're weary. My guess is if you're in health care, I don't know, if you're in any service industry. I don't know, some people, I re I've read statistics that, that cardiac events go up by 20% on Monday. Why? Because people are stressed out about going back to work. How many of you are there? How many of you are tired and weary and broken? On the verge of burnout. I mean, Jesus says, come. Isn't that good news? Come. Learn how to come to me, because you're going to find rest. Abundant living begins with a willingness to come to Jesus. Come to me. I just want to experience friendship with you. In a world that often measures value by our success, Jesus wants to value the value of our life to be measured by intimacy with him. And then what does he do? A second invitation. He says, take up. Come to me and take my yoke upon you. Now, what is a yoke, right? I mean, outside of breakfast and having eggs, I mean, that's the only yokes that I, I talk about, I think, right? I love breakfast, by the way. And I love eggs. But that's not the yoke he's talking about, is it? Now, in Jesus' day, a yoke would have been as familiar as a truck or a tractor, right? Because it was a tool. It was a tool that was used that would combine a couple of oxen together so that they could do work in the fields. That's what a yoke was. Now, there were some negative connotations. I mean, it could be a burdensome expectation, that, like the yoke of slavery. That, but that's not what Jesus means here. What he's talking about is, is a metaphor for apprenticeship or discipleship. It's this idea of joining with me. So when Jesus is saying, take my yoke upon you, what he's really saying is, join me 
in this life. Join me in this work. Partner with me. Make my work your work. Make my life your life. Relinquish your life and your concerns and allow me to direct you on your path. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want to show you how to live. This is what uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer had to say. Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, was martyred at the age of 39. Why? Because he was a, an outspoken critic of the Nazis in World War II. This is what he says about this passage. He says, only the man or woman who follows the command of Jesus single-mindedly and unresistingly lets his yoke rest on him, finds his burden easy, and under its gentle pressure receives the power to persevere in the right way. The command of Jesus is hard, unutterably hard, for those who try to resist it. But for those who willingly submit, the yoke is easy and the burden is light. The commandment of Jesus is not a sort of spiritual shock treatment. Jesus asks nothing of us without giving the strength to perform it. I love that. His commandment never seeks to destroy life, but to foster, strengthen, and heal it. It means surrendering, friends. Maybe before we take up, maybe what we ought to be thinking about, what yoke do I need to lay down? Is there some sort of addiction or attachment that I am under the slavery or yoke of? Or maybe some inner yokes of perfectionism or control or security or fear or even judgment. Cultural yokes can be burdensome as well, where we think that our value and our identity is found in our achievement, our power and position, or even fulfillment through our possessions. Maybe the first question is, what is it that I need to lay down before I take up the yoke of Jesus, which is light? which is life-giving. Take my yoke upon you. And then Jesus invites us to learn. Come to me, take my yoke upon you, join me in this, and then learn from me. Learn from me. Now, I don't know what image comes to mind when he says learn from me. Now, I kind of was first thinking about this. I was going... Man, if that means going back to the classroom and taking a bunch of tests there, I'm out, right? I really don't want to have anything to do with that. But some of you, I think, I've heard this enough to think that, you know, well, I don't know about enough. I don't know. Before you're willing to sort of jump in with Jesus, like, oh, I don't know enough. Well, what does that mean? I have a really good friend. His, his name is Paul. He's 76 years old. He has this crazy genetics. He looks like he could be 50, right? He, he, I, I think he's going to live to be 150. I mean, he is uh, just very young. But I, I, I love Paul. You know why? Because he's a friend to me. And he believes in me. And I go to him. And I tell him about my life. And I ask him for his advice. He's kind of like a wise sage, Right? He teaches me. And I know that he prays for me, and I know that he wants to encourage me, and I know that he has my... I mean, I don't know if you have a friend like that, but I would encourage you to have a friend like that, friends. I think that's more what Jesus is saying. It's like, I want to be your wise sage. I want to be your friend. Now, I did this mental exercise once upon a time. It kind of blew my mind, okay? So I want you to do it with me. So imagine you've got your whiteboard in, in, in your mind, in your head, right? And on the whiteboard, what I want you to, to put at the top, top is, who would call me friend? So you're making a list. Who would call me friend? Are you thinking about people, right? You're thinking about 
Who would call you a friend? It's a great question. Now, on that list, is Jesus on the list? This is what he says in John 15. I know he's talking to his disciples, those who are like, you know, coming to him, those who are willing to take up his yoke and learn from him. He says, look, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. Listen to that. Jesus calls us friends. You're my friend. You're my friend. You are my friend. In fact, I want you to learn. I want to give you all the things that I know. I want to, I want to give you that. I want to give that in our friendship. I want to be your fan. I want to show you how to live. Come to me. Take my yoke. Learn from me. The pressure's off. All I need to do is follow. But here's one thing I've learned. It doesn't mean that that Jesus isn't going to lead us in places that are challenging. I don't know if you know John John and Christy. They are partners that we support in Haiti. Uh, We had a chance to host them about a week ago in our home and uh, just reminded of their incredible story. You know, John John is a native-born Haitian, and Christy was born and raised in northwest Iowa. They both had a love for Jesus and a passion for Haiti, and God brought them together. And they got married in 2005. They went down to Haiti, and they just reminded me again, wow, God sometimes leads us in places that are, whoa, amazing. They were sharing how they went, and they had absolutely nothing. They had no support. They had no kind of financial commitments. They just went back to a place where John John was from, and it was, it was full of witch doctors and, and voodoo. And that's where they're going to start their ministry. <laughs> I mean, when they, say, when they say God provides, I believe them. Because that's what they said. I mean, God provided I mean, they didn't just know it here. They they knew it here. Day to day. They were living day to day, week to week, month to month. They had nothing. And I remember uh, John John was telling, he said, you know, fairly early on in this ministry, he's like, we were hosting a missionary friend. And sure enough, uh, the witch doctors were doing their voodoo thing. They had a gathering late at night. That's when they sort of gathered. It was drums, you know, just all this noise, a lot of drinking. And it was crazy. And John John turned to his, his missionary friend and said, I'm going. I'm going to go talk to them. And the missionary was like, John John, you, you could get killed. You, might, you, you could die. And if you know John John's story, his father was killed by a witch doctor, friends. But he said, no, I'm, I'm going to go. <laughs> so he took his Bible. He walked into this group. And, and they saw him come in, and they, and they just kind of stopped their craziness for a moment. And he said, oh, some, some yelled at him, what do you want? He said, I just want to talk to you about another way. You know what he did? He opened up his Bible. And guess what he read? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. He closed his Bible. He said it was the most amazing thing. They just kind of packed up their things, and they went away. The next morning, one of the witch doctors came to John John and said, Would you teach me about this other way? When I was there about five years ago, I had the privilege of sort of witnessing uh, the conversion of a witch doctor. It was crazy. I believe it was about number 50 that John John had been working with. And uh, we were there as a team, 
And uh, John John had been meeting with this, this guy for six months, and it was the day in which he was going to Yep, step across the line. He was going to make a commitment to Christ. Now, what that meant was really significant. In fact, we all gathered as a team. We gathered and we started singing and praying around this house. And what John John was asking him to do was to take everything, everything from his past, everything from his past life, all the weird stuff. I mean, it was bizarro stuff. Bones, drums, I mean, relics, things you, 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 you can imagine, Right? And one by one, he took that and put it on a pile. And one by one, he just kept filling up this, this pile of stuff, and it was lit on fire. It was one of the most amazing pictures of one moving from death to life, from darkness into the light, of this transformation that happens when we choose to follow Jesus. It was incredible. And then I can just, we, we're kind of down in a valley, and all these little huts were up, or up above, and people were just coming out, just watching what was happening. It was an amazing picture to see him moving into the kingdom of light. Jesus not only came to save us and make life with God possible, he wants us to live an abundant, purposeful, meaningful kind of life where we are willing to come to him, we are willing to take up his yoke, we're willing to learn. That's the way that we follow him. And we live an abundant kind of life. I'd invite you to do that. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your goodness and your grace. I'm so thankful that you came to us and you invited us just to take the pressure off, to live by grace, to come and find strength and rest in you, to find freedom in you, to learn how to live this life the way you would desire us to live. Lord, I don't know what we came in with this morning, but God, would you help us just to lay it down at your feet so that we can take up what you would have for us. This freedom of shared life together. I pray that in Jesus' name.